Okay. okay, so when we did the low voltage system, you guys advised us for me, you laid out your, um, your smoke detectors, your security system. Um, I don't know if you guys did, I haven't looked at the low voltage risers. We're gonna look at it today. If you have not done the clock system, you're gonna be doing a riser for the clock system. A very important clock system riser is right here. So signaling system that we're gonna talk about guys, a few things um, today. Let me try to synchronize myself. I always forget so I can't write on it. Uh, okay, here you go. If I can get myself synchronized. Oh, what happened to that? I have to my, uh, book. Huh. Interesting. Okay, I'm not even on twenty second yet. I'm not projecting. Sorry for that. All right, so let's go to. Okay, so let me do the synchronization first. Awesome. Okay, so um, let's go directly to this baby. And <laughs> so, what we're the three systems that we're going to talk about, guys, is um, oops, is the clock system. The master clock system, we have a master clock system, we have a program system and paging system. So these are the three systems I'm going to talk about. Uh, master clock system, program system, paging system, actually also the fire alarm system. Um, so master clock system, like we had in our project, uh, we had what, 12 and 15, 12 and 15 display unit uh, driven by a master clock with display unit you're going to see in a second here. For one main reason, if you're on manufacturing floor, you need to be able to see the time. So that's basically what it is. We'll talk about the program system, they call it, and the paging system. The paging system is nothing that other than what we did in our in our project. So if you have speakers and you can page people. Uh, fire alarm system, you know what the fire alarm system is. If you have a fire, you need to be able to detect, detect that you have a fire and announce to the people so they can exit the building they have a fire. The program system, guys, they use it as in a, in a manufacturing floor. You need to be able to communicate with tones with people. So when they hear a certain a certain noise, they know that it's a break time and so forth. So that's directly related to communicating with people for break times um, and so forth in a manufacturing environment. Imagine an assembly line, and you they hear uh, the bell, and everybody goes to break. So that's that's basically the three system that we have. The master clock system, guys, that we're going to have um, display time. Uh, the the display units. You're going to look at them in a second here. It's a it's a they call them display units. There's a master clock that receives the signal from the satellite, send the signal internally into the building. Two different units, two different units that display the light, and these units have to be located in uh, typically in public areas for people. So what they use as the display units, they have large size LEDs to display them, indicate the time that can be seen from a far distance. Uh, display size greater than this amount will generally use different technologies for it. So there are two, really two technologies right now. Either you communicate directly between the display unit and the satellite and receive it, one or you have a central one, my understanding is if you have a big building and you have multiple of them in the building and areas that in the bottom of the building that cannot receive the signal, what they do is they have an antenna at the top. They bring the signal directly to a master control system and then they re retransmit the signal internally inside the building so the other display units can receive it. Wireless or typically wireless right now. In the past, guys, they used to drive them wire with, with wire. So. LEDs is going to be displaying them. Uh, that's what you're going to do. Here's what I would like you guys to do if you have not done that. Uh, you're going to do a master clock system. This is happened to be a wired master clock system. So what you do is you grab, uh, you buy this one, you get your signal from the satellite and wired or wireless, typically wireless, you send the signal, you, you capture the signal with the master clock and you send it to the display unit, either via wired, twisted pair number 18, 
or you can send it wireless to these display units. Now, uh, Jeff, you're looking at me and say, Chad, now they can have this display unit communicate directly with the satellite and receive the signal. The, uh, you know, the, the my, and I'm not an expert in the clock system. My understanding, if you're in an area, like at the bottom of a building, two floors underground in the bottom of building, downtown Minneapolis, you might not be able to receive the signal. So what they do is they get an antenna, direct the signal to a master clock system, and rebroadcast that signal um, into the building so it can display the time. Uh, we use wired system. Well, a lot of the stuff that these are, these actually are communicating direct. The time, the time clock. These are also have. Wired. Are oh, you time in? Yeah, wired. These are wired. Yeah, but these are not. Yeah, these are wired. But we're talking about this display unit right here. This can communicate directly and receive a signal from the satellite. So uh, no, there's no master driving yet. But if you put this one down in the basement or done with it, you might not receive the signal. So you need to rebroadcast it. So, so who am I going to pick up? Zach, you're going to grab one like this, my friend. And have you guys done a riser for the low, low voltage riser for a clock system? So if you haven't done a riser for the clock system, you're going to do a riser for the clock system. How is the riser going to look like? It's going to look exactly like this. Minus, add a minus what? Wires, minus wires. So you're gonna put display unit, a couple of display units, and a symbol of of, um, of wireless, and you have your master clock and display unit that display the, the time. Any question is about that? That's what you guys did with me, and we used the, what is it, 12 and 15, uh, Jeff, right? 12 and 15 units. We're assuming that we're gonna have a master that drives all these units. Cool, any question about the clock system? So that's what's nice about this chapter, kind of refresh a little bit. I know we have we have finished laying out our riser, but the riser is still here, guys. You still can go there, and if you have not done the riser, that will be a requirement. Okay, master clock system. How does it work? And don't ask me because I'm not an expert in it. There are two technologies, my understanding. Technology number one is they use single phase synchronous motor. Synchronous motor, guys, are used at a very high horsepower and at a very low horsepower, fraction of horsepower. So use a synchronous motor that run at synchronous speed, 60 hertz, um, and they capture the they capture the time to a synchronous motor. Uh, what's the problem with a synchronous motor? There's a couple of minutes per month. They get off by a couple of minutes per month. I don't know if you guys heard a couple of couple of years ago there was a discussion about allowing the national grid to offset their frequency. I can't remember. Was it 0.5 percent? or so adjusting it like right now they have to maintain their frequency 60 hertz the national grid has to be maintaining plus or minus one i think one um, one hertz so you can go 59 or 61 something like this so they want to open that widen that gap and guess what was the issue with widening the gap the motors care less if you have a motor for the most part they don't care less about adding one hertz or removing one hertz from a 60 hertz Guess what's going to be screwed up? The, your synchronous motors, the time, you can screw up the time. So anyway, so their argument is now with everybody going digital, so why, why do we need these synchronous motors? So anyway, so that was a big argument about adjusting the grid frequency will affect all the synchronous motors nationwide that are driven to get you the time. Everything else will be okay. And now with the digital world, people are saying it's, they're becoming useless anyway. So, just be aware of that one. The frequency will drive actually at the time. What's the problem with it? You have to adjust it every um, a couple of minutes off every month. So, if you're too precise, that might not be your your uh, your choice. The second technology that they use, guys, is they call it quartz crystal. They vibrate. They put some um, some voltage, AC voltage, um, across the quartz, and they vibrate it. And that vibration captures the time. The way they vibrate the uh, quartz crystal, they, they capture the time. Resonate at some specific frequency when the AC voltage is applied to it. And um, so that's another technology. Resonant frequency, extremely constant. And what's the good thing about this technology, Jeff? The quartz, they call them uh, quartz crystal. Seconds per month. So we went from, uh, from uh, um, offset minutes per month into seconds per month. Is this a progress? Yeah, for the people who are in this technology, it's a progress. For you guys and I, we really don't get into the guts of that. We know how it works. We can have two technologies right now. 
the quartz um, um, crystal, or you can have the simplest motors. Um, and, um, and typically, they're very accurate now, like I said, and you display them in your building. Any comments about these technologies that they use? Any comments about the technologies? OK, so that will be FYI. OK, that's it about buzzers. The only thing I would, uh, about the clocks, the only thing I would like to emphasize, Adam, is you guys are required to do a, a display unit and a master clock for your for a building. So what I'm expecting to have is three things on the master. Master clock here. One display unit, 12 inches, one display unit, um, uh, 15 inches, and how many of each? That's it. That's what I'm expecting you guys to have. No wires between them. They're going to be communicating wireless. Okay? So that was the clock system. Any comments about the clock system, my friends? Any comments about the clock system? There's companies that specialize in all this one. How far you can, how big the clock has to be before you can't see it. So there's a lot of, a lot of issues um, involved in it. Okay, the second system that we have in this, um, the second system that we have here is called program system. They call it program system. It's not a paging system, it's program system. The program system guys, um, uh, it provides automatic signals for operation of horns, bills, and buzzers. You want to buzz the people to get out because of typically manufacturing. So they, you, you hear a buzz and that indicates it's a break time. Uh, when we guys go to assembly line, if you have an assembly line, uh, you can't go for your smoking break or I don't know if they give smoking breaks anymore for your lunch or for your break, whatever you do in your break. You can't go for your break and leave that simple line unattended. Your job affects everybody else. I'm not going to tell you something that you don't know. So to organize the labor, you have to communicate with people with buzzers and so forth. So you hear the buzz, here's your time, stop, shut the system down, go have a break. Okay, so that's what they use, buzzers, bells, and horns. Um, so beginning and end of the shifts, lunch period, breaks, these are the type of the signals that we do. Now, Jeff, in our project, we did not have this system. We, didn't, we don't have this system. So we did not install a system like this. We installed the paging system, which could be used. You know, since these systems all can be interfaced with each other, guys, you can put a buzzer on the paging system to indicate this a break time. But that, in particular, is supposedly designed for the manufacturing, communicate with people in the field. Different signals to plant different parts uh, at proper time. So you can, this system can, guys can make your break at five o'clock and somebody else break at six o'clock or, you know, it changes the time, the shifts and all this stuff. Um, it communicates with different devices, with different messages. Um, it broadcasts one message to one area or to part of the plant. You know what I mean? They can, they can, it's like everything programmable. You can make it, you can talk to one device. I want the people in this office to have a break now, but the people next door to them not. So it is the possibility is endless. Any comments about the program system, so-called program system? So really you're communicating with the labor. That's all what you do. So what does it do for a living? Um, computer, everything is computerized, guys. You have a microprocessor that's right inside, the, in, in, in front of you guys. Microprocessor inside your uh, laptop. Uh, time can be used as a controller. So we have a microprocessor. Uh, base programmer timer can be used as a controller. So that's your controller. A uh, program for up to a hundred event, a thousand event, and even more now with the digital. So you can send so many signal at so many different times to so many different locations. Does that make sense? You, the communication that you can do. Um, you can do cyclic events. Can be programmed to occur every minute, hour, day, week. A uh, combination of, of, of any of these, um, any of the 32 output channels can be tuned on at the same time. So I'm not going to tell you something you don't know, guys. When you have a program, you have input devices and output devices, and in between, a language that you program this machine to do. So, um, so you can send multiple events, multiple times, multiple buzzer and bills and so forth to different locations at different times and so forth. Uh, suppose it in 2011. Why? What was the time the program was possible to say the program runs for cassette tape? <laughs> um, well, they use, I believe, they use cassette tapes right now to record uh, the old stuff, that big, I don't know, I'm not really, don't, I don't know, even say that there's a lot of, uh, yeah, cassette tapes or DVDs now and all this technology. But I thought cassette tapes are still used for m major major event, like you, you know, record uh, 50 hours or so for 
forth, you have volume. Okay, that's what I'm trying to look for volume. Yeah, I don't know if you know, do, like all these government things when they record them, don't they have put them in some type of a tape now? I don't know if they moved into the DVDs. Anyway, so you can record them. Um, cassette tapes, that's what you were talking about. Cassette tapes or DVDs, I don't know if they use DVDs. Uh, you, can, you can program them, you can save them. Uh, digital clocks to drive things, clock operated by internal crystal oscillator, exactly that's the technology that they, we just talked about. We have a battery uh, and battery charger, guys, so if you lose the system, uh, it's, it has a battery backup. Most of, most of low voltage systems, guys, end up with a tiny little battery anyway, so if you are to lose a system, like security system, program system like this, fire alarm system, all of them have some backup power that will give you probably a, a 60 minute or so of work out of the system if you lose the power. So it's a, your security systems are running because it's backed up. Yep. Okay, so that's um, that's your program system. Any question is about the program system? Any question about the program system? So you accept big horns in certain areas to communicate these tones and bills and buzzers that coming to communicate with the lever, with an assembly line lever, right? Any comment about the program system? That's your program system. The second, the third system that they talk about, guys, is paging system. Paging system, you, my friends, are notoriously facing, uh, you have designed a paging system, convey messages to all plant areas. Now, some of you will ask, what's the difference between paging system and the program system? They could be the same system. Right, you can communicate with words or you communicate with signals with, with people. Okay, um, system selection conservation. When you have a paging system, typically when you have a paging system, you're communicating verbally with people. You're sending them a message, um, a, 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 um, not a tone, a message. Okay, you guys have done paging system in, in the area. I'm gonna remind you, we said we want every area, common areas to have at least two speakers. We placed them 30. What is it, 30 or 40 on centers? Every common area have to have at least two speakers. Manufacturing area, we have to have horn speakers because it's loud. Um, so these are the stuff that you guys have done and that's what this uh, chapter is talking about. What is the amount of area to be covered and the number of paging units needed? Uh, we talk two in every area, common area, as well as you can cover 30 to 40 on center when you have these speakers in the ceiling. If you have a horn speakers, what did he say about the horn speakers? I think you can put them 50 on center or 40 horn speakers, you have a big horn speaker, 50 to 40 feet on center around the whole area that that should uh, roughly, roll of thumb, get you there. Any comments, guys, about the placement of these? Look at the design. The designer system should permit expansion as the plant increases in size. We don't go too deep into the design. Typically, guys, you have a twisted pairs when you communicate with these. Twisted pairs, number 18, and send the signal, receive a signal at low voltage from them. Um, twisted pair. Um, so that's so when you when you start adding your pairs, guys, and you add more speakers to the wire, take into consideration that you might be required to add another speaker somewhere else. So don't overload it. Exactly like we do with, with lighting circuit, guys. We don't load our lighting circuit for future expansion. Same thing. You don't want to load your speaker circuits because of future expansion. Uh, should the paging system be voice tone or combination of both? With your paging system, guys, you can announce typically messages or you can have tones uh, or combination. The area of the plant required uh, explosion proof. Do we have an explosion proof in our area? Yep, there's a room. When you have an explosion proof, guys, in one area, what do you need? Explosion proof. You need an explosion proof, right, Jeff? You guys know that. Explosion proof equipment in a, in a class one, dev one location. So who cares? Now you're, you're paying five times more for the same speaker. That's all unless you're using physically safe systems. So that's things to consider. Um, weatherproof, if you're putting speakers outside or in a wet location, it has to be rated for wet location. Uh, what is the ambient noise level of the plant? This is very important, guys. My understanding, and I'm not an expert in speakers there, in order for you to, read, to hear me, I have to speak at 15 decibels higher than the ambient. 15 decibels higher than ambient. Uh, that's in order for you to hear to hear so if the ambient um, is a hundred jackhammer saw you're standing right next to somebody who's banging with that jackhammer or saw 
that will be close to 100. In order to hear him or communicate with him or her, you have to talk at a volume of 115. That's shouting. Okay, so that's kind of the, get you the idea, the ambient, they call it the ambient noise level, the ambient noise level. You have to know what the ambient noise level of the plant. Here's a good example for you. I thought that was really cool. Uncomfortably, uncomfortably loud, 195, circular saw. Have you guys done this? Everybody have done the circular saw right there. If, if you want to talk to somebody, look at the 195. Can you communicate with people when they're, they, you have to have protection, ear protection anyway, uh, higher. I think what is it, higher than 90 um, or 80, you have to have to have, by OSHA and so forth, you have to have an ear protection. I can't remember if it's 80 or 90, right around this limit. You have to have ear protection anyway. So look at Jack Hammer, 140, 120 Thunder. Uh, very loud, industrial plant. Uh, if you're industrial plant, that's loud. Loud is, uh, is a press room, foundry factory, these are loud. So probably at around 90, you start having an ear protection. Moderate, 70 to 75, that's normal conversation. So where's Chad now? Where, where do you put me, guys? Between seven, am I on uh, 70, 75 or 80? Loud, am I like a press room? Okay, so right probably around 70, 75, normal conversation. In a hospital, quiet, right? So that will get you 40. Very quiet, 30 to 35. That's that three feet, though. We're a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. If you're further, you're going to talk about how it, how how you have to project in order to reach the the further people. So 30 to 35. So we probably would be right now when I, when I'm not talking, would be around what 55, when everybody maybe 50, 60. Okay. So these are your ambient temperature. Who cares? When you design your system, you have to talk 15 15 decibels louder than this in order to come to be heard. There's another. This is important, guys, for two reasons. This curve is important for two reasons, the ones who are going to be designers. Reason number one is when you design your paging system, you're going to make sure that everybody can hear you, unlike our paging. Did you guys hear the paging system here? Do you hear it? Horrible. Hear Completely, it. right? Horrible. So that's badly, this is a good example of badly designed paging system. Badly, badly designed paging system. Voltage drop, probably high in voltage drop, low in volume. Um, so when you design it, you don't want you want to make the ambient noise that where everybody can hear it. You don't want to blast your ears there, but I can't hear it. So that's, you have to, there's a lot of impedance balancing between them and so forth. But here's a, a really interesting curve. Every time you double the distance, you lose six decibels. Very, very important. So look, if I'm right now, you, Jeff, you are 10 feet away from me, right? So I'm sitting at 10 feet here. Um, I'm, if, and I'm, let's assume at 10 feet, I have 110 decibels. Right now, you hear me at 110 decibels. Let's assume that. If you move another 10 feet back, that will give you twice the uh, distance. So that will put you at 20 feet from me. It will drop it down to 104. So you lose six decibels every time you double the distance. This is very important for, for, for designing. that. That's why we said two speakers in the room, right? So you can balance that decibels in every area. Uh, 30 on center, 30 to 40 on center. That to get you, the people to hear you in every location here, you would uh, enough, enough to, to recognize the message. And the other thing that this is important is when we design uh, generators outdoor, Adam, when you have a generator outdoor, the inspector will come with uh, a noise measurement tool to measure the noise. Um, and if it, the noise is above a certain value, they will require you to build a wall because of noise ordinance in, in cities. So when you design your generator outdoor, you're going to use this criteria. The first, every time you double the distance from the property line, you're going to lose what? Six decibels. So you can design it far away from the property line enough to get you below the threshold that required by the city ordinance. Does that make sense, guys, how important this topic is? So you double the distance. So, so we went from 40 to 80, guys. We dropped another six decibels. Every time you double the distance, you drop six decibels. That could be good news if I have loud generator outdoor and people are complaining about it. So I double the distance to, so they can't hear it. Or it could be bad news because if I put my speaker here and double the distance between where the people are, they can't hear me. So you have to use it when you design your speaker system. Any comments, any questions? So when we say 30 to 40 guys on center, depending on the system, 
you can really, that's taking this into consideration. Okay, paging system, um, you can tape messages to instruct employees to the nature of the emergency. You can also use for emergency guys. Um, um, we have a message here that you can use Mr. Lock, Mr. Lockout, I think, Mr. Lockout. That's a message that you hear. You typically shut down the, uh, the light, lock the door, and go under the, the desks because there's a, a, a weirdo with a gun outside. So that's there's different messages that people communicate to through the paging system. Um, for separate tone scan, we have whale. And we have high, low, we have uh, whoop, and we have horn, so steady tones. These are different messages, guys. Also on the speaker, they can communicate to give different signals based on what, what the company is doing. Okay, any question, guys, about the paging system? That's basically what the paging system is. If I am to summarize the paging system with one little thing, this is the best character. Be aware of that. Six decibels every time you double the distance. That's all. Um, if you can't maintain that one, you have to build a wall, right? That becomes big deal with generators. Okay, fire alarm systems. The last system that we're going to talk about, guys, is fire alarm system. Fire alarm system is very simple. You have a controller, which is CCU, central control unit. You guys haven't done uh, computer studies. They call it central. That's what you have in front of you, a laptop. Central control unit um, is a laptop or a computer almost. Process and produce communication interface between the CCU and the system controller. So you have a controller, guys, completely digital controller right now. And you have an input devices and output devices to it. They have input modules and output modules. And the input modules you can bring. What do you bring in an input module, guys, if I alive system? What's the input? Pulse station, right? Uh, how about uh, smoke detector, heat detector, beam detector, um, duct smoke detector. What else can we br bring? Um, see, those are input coming signals coming into the fire alarm. What are the output that you try to output modules? Your horns, horn stro strobe, or your strobes, or sometimes um, you can tie it to the speakers so you can alarm. You can use your speakers as um, an output device of the um, of the fire alarm system. Okay, up to a hundred processor can be connected to the CCU, and I really don't like to because these are different technology goes. 100 processor to one computer basically and every processor can handle up to 100 controller and every controller my understanding can handle up to four input devices so you can do your math so 100 times 100 times four that'll get you how many input devices and output devices you can put on these these equipment so when they design a system like this no a processor is a digital it's your laptop yeah yeah very small, it's the transistor based technology. Um, so everything is coming. Yeah, the controllers, yeah, controllers, yeah, they, they bring, well, you bring a relay, <laughs> they are electronic relays. You bring a signal, they are not digital relays. Electronic relays, you bring a signal to them and they capture that signal, the fire alarm, you close the contact, you energize, and the contact is gonna be an electronic contact. Um, an electronic relay, and that's how you interface. Then you send a signal inside the fire alarm system with five volt. You're, you're dealing with digital mm -hmm. computer, so you don't have coils. We're not having coil type relays here. All everything is digital transistor based relays. Um, each so you can see how many inputs and outputs. So when you design a system, guys, a fire alarm system, the most important thing for a fire alarm system is to indicate how many input devices you need and how many output devices you need. And my understanding right now. And, and Darren, I'm not an expert in the fire alarm system. My understanding is you can put um, hundreds and hundreds of, of, of devices on one uh, line signaling circuit or signaling line circuit, output circuit, because they're all digital. They all, mm -hmm. you send a signal to them, and they're monitored digital devices, unlike in the past where you have to put them in zones. Right now, each one of them can create a zone by itself. And all which, so imagine all these lights above your head are smoke detectors. I can take two, a twisted pair, number 18 or number 16, and tie all these with that twisted pair all the way and back to the fire alarm system. And for the digital system, and, 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 and the controller can talk to each one of these lights or these smoke detectors and check on it. Are you there? Yep, I am there. 
Are you there? Yeah, I'm there. They send a signal, guys, to monitor the to monitor the system. And if one of them goes off, it sends a signal to fire alarm system, and it tells you that not only the signaling line circuit one has there's one of them goes off, but which one of them. So that's the capability of the digital uh, fire alarm system. Okay, type of NFS model used to determine the system control. We have motor control. Then, then you have input on output devices, and then Jeff, you have also you need to communicate with other other places. Motor control, uh, the duct smoke detector, guys. If if it senses there is a duct in the um, smoke in the duct, what does it do? It it tied to a relay. The relay is interfaced with the control system or air handling unit, and it opens a contact to shut down the air handling unit so you don't spread smoke through the whole building. Uh, burglar alarm. If you have a fire uh, and your door, your rainbow, you you they lock the doors because of theft, right? If there's a fire, do you really want the people to be burned because you're afraid they're going to steal? So what they do, guys, is they release all these locks. If there's a fire in a the store, they release the send a signal burglar alarm interface. It opens the locks and all the doors and the back doors they open, so you can push and get up. You know, so for uh, ground fault detection. Um, to interface with TV cameras so you can send a signal that you can zoom your camera to the area where the smoke detector is so you know it's, can you just see the interface the capability it would be great if we if, if you ever tour the um, the convention center in Minneapolis and see how all these systems talk together so if there's a, a fire alarm guys in, in this corner instead of sending somebody there they can zoom right on that area and see is this really fire or is it just uh, um, a false alarm. So they can interface these systems really good with each other. Each fire alarm module contains momentary contacts, switch at front of the cover. So they also have, you can test these modules manually, test these modules so they have switches on them. Switch permit the alarm to be operated auto or manually for testing if they trouble or not. Um, Combination of smoke detectors and manual pull handles. These are your input, right? You have smoke detector, heat detector, beam detector, duct smoke detector, all these input devices. So one of them is, is since the alarm would be activated. Audible alarm, by fire alarm code, guys, you have to have audible and visual alarms. That's why your horn strokes uh, placed strategically in all public areas, right? That's what you guys did in the project. <clears throat> Uh, produced by the paging system, or you can interface it with the paging system. Use it as your as a part of it as your uh, um, file on system. Um, and then this is just talks about the sto the uh, strobe lights, high intensity, 75 flashes per minute, powered directly by the smoke detector and so forth. There's so many mod. There's a module, guys, that can sense if there is a smoke and activate only certain uh, horn strobes in certain areas. Okay, here's what, what you guys have done with your friend Chad. Here's um, everything here is really inside the, all the power, the power source, the processor, the CCU, and the controller. All are inside the guts of the, the fire alarm system, typically. Mm -hmm. And the output and the input modules are added to, they can add it to. So I can have, look at this input module, can handle, I think, up to four, this particular one. I can bring one smoke detector, or if it's digital, I can bring close to 100 smoke detectors in one signaling circuit. Uh, same thing, uh, pull handle I can bring if it's digital, one pull handle to the input uh, device, or I can bring 100 of them, dizzy chain them, and bring them all the way down, and if one of them goes off, it will alarm, and it will tell you which one of them. Not just because they give them a digital address, um, every one of them will have a digital. The same thing for the output guys, you have strobes, or you can interface with the security system, paging system, um, lock system, open the doors. Um, you can send the signal, supervised ones. You have to have send the signal to the fire department and and a bunch of other things. Everything inside the fire. So what you do really, what you bring, everything here is inside. You bring the power. You have to power it, and then you bring also uh, the strobes. Like you guys brought all your strobes. You brought the smoke detector, the pull station, the input and output devices are brought through. Uh, number 18 or 16 wire, fire rated wire, and daisy chain in a digital system, and up to 100 device on the same, on the same signaling circuit. Um, so it becomes really the the issue becomes a voltage drop. If you go further, then you have to go higher. 
in real life, the only you're just putting all those things all in one. Well, they're different technologies. Sometimes they, they like uh, uh, the, all these can be in one, or these modules can be added to, added to, added to. You can see the fire on the, the system right here. It's like a PLC, guys. You here's the CPU here for the PLC. Everything here is added to. They keep adding all these modules to it. Some technology are like this. These are more adaptable for future expansion. And some are locked. You take this amount, you live with it. If you exceed it, what do you need to do? You need to have a new one. So there's different technologies that you can buy. Any comments, any question about the riser for the fire alarm? Any comment there, my friend? Any comments, any questions? So that's basically what this master clock paging system, paging or locking uh, or, or locating system and fire alarm system. So that's what we do. Let me see if um, I missed any of the pictures that uh, we did, and then I'll give you guys a quick break here. Uh, where am I here, Chad? Okay. Um, okay. Okay, we, we looked at um, the display. I want you guys to do this as a riser. Talked about this one, talk about this, microprocessor. Different type of clocking system, guys, paging system. And you guys have seen horns and all this good stuff. You can, here's the uh, fire alarm modules, input output modules, and the ability to test them. Can you guys see that test button? You have the alarm, trouble, and normal. All of them have this capability, guys. Smoke detectors, pull stations, fire horn strobes, and that's about it. Any comments, guys? Any questions? Any comments? Any questions? Okay, five minutes, exactly five, because I really would like to go over uh, uh, another chapter, guys, before Michelle is here. Thank you.